In the UK, 5 to 10 percent of the population with age more than 65 will develop Alzheimer's, while 20 percent of the population with age more than 80 will develop Alzheimer's. 61 percent of the cases are female, while 39 percent are male. With this bias, it may be partially due to the longer lifespan of female. However, the reason for increased incidence of female is still unknown. The cost of dementia is huge, around 23 billion pounds per year. Most is due to social care and unpaid workers. However, a small amount is due to healthcare costs and productivity losses. Dementia research has the least funding, is 12 times lower than cancer research. In unaffected individuals, the APP protein is processed differently to Alzheimer's sufferers. Normally, the beta amyloid region is cleaved by alpha secretase, releasing the soluble APP fragment alpha. A second cleavage by the gamma secretase releases the intracellular domain and P3 fragments. In Alzheimer's patients, it is beta secretase that makes the first cleavage releasing a soluble APP fragment beta. Gamma secretase then cleaves the intracellular domain leaving the neurotoxic fragment which accumulates into an oligomer aggregate, causing the amyloid plaques. Tau protein is a microtubule associated protein and it is found abundantly in the neurons of the brain. In Alzheimer's, it is hyperphosphorylated and the ability to stabilize microtubule is impaired. The overall result is impaired cellular transport and communication between cells, eventually leading to neuronal cell death. Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative condition, which often involves the degeneration of the brain. And in addition to having a problem with how the brain works, it can also have an effect on all the people around us. In the same way that cancer has an effect on all the family around them. So it's really important to understand what happens during neurodegeneration and how Alzheimer's research can help the people who are suffering. My work here in the lab is using the fruit fly as a model organism to study the disease. One of the problems with looking at a human situation is that you can't experiment on the human itself. So we need another system where we can address the same questions. The advantage of using the fruit fly is that it has a very short generation time. Additionally, it's quite cheap to maintain, so surrounding me are several different types of fly that I can use to assess whether gene X will interact with gene Y. And so we can use these genetic tricks to be able to ask fundamental questions that are important for Alzheimer's. So we can analyze the brain, and we can ask whether the same processes that occur in a, an Alzheimer's patient also occur in a fly brain. In terms of cost, the fly is a lot cheaper to house and to maintain. The fly requires very little maintenance. They can be kept in tubes, and you can allow them to lay eggs. As they lay eggs in the food, they eventually crawl up the tube and pupate. This whole generation type takes roughly two weeks. With a fly, it's very simple to generate huge amounts of data. With a mouse, it will take a lot longer. You also need infrastructure in place for the mouse. You need a mouse house. You need a place to store them. You need staff to manage them, to clean their cages. Whereas with a fly, they can manage themselves. In terms of research time, a more complex organism is going to take a lot longer to do the work. So the fly is a relatively simple model, it only has four pairs of chromosomes, in which case it's a lot easier to use the fly and a lot quicker to generate data. So once we've set up a cross, the next thing we need to do is analyse the data. Often this involves a dissection where we can label specific neurons to see which ones have degenerated. We use an advanced confocal microscope to image some of our data. And what this involves is a laser that scans through a section of your tissue, and then chooses a slightly lower section and continues to scan through section after section until you've compiled a high resolution image of your data. 
This can then be reconstructed into three dimensions and we can analyze in great detail what happens to individual neurons. So in this case, we're looking at a rotation view of the central nervous system, the equivalent of the spinal column of a fly. So using this technique, we're able to label and show which neurons we've targeted with too much of a protein. And in this case, we can see whether they're degenerating or not.